Hey guys, welcome to Agamas Church. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We're so glad that you can worship with us and we hope you enjoy.
Well, hello to all of you on the other side of your screens today. I pray that you have had an incredible week and that you are excited about being here in worship with us now. I know that for me, I'm excited to have you with us today. I'm grateful that you are not um, being lazy at home and trying to use this as like a time to quarantine yourself from church, all right? Like, Quarantine yourself from other people, but don't quarantine yourself from the Lord, okay? So uh, th th I'm glad that you're tuning in and being a part of service with us today. Our God is there in the good times. He's there in the bad times. Um, he's there um, when we get together and shoot fireworks and celebrate things together. He's there in the times that we have to wear face masks and stand six feet apart. He is always there. He's there when you go into a building to worship. And he's in your home with you, in your pajamas for worship today. So, welcome to church. Today is the final week of our four-week series that we have been studying through together. Um, the name of this series is Sin and the Sinner. Sin and the Sinner. It's been a very complex and intense study for me personally. And, and I pray that it's, that it's challenged you. I pray that it's made you think and learn more about your understanding of this kind of two-part struggle that we, we all have. There's a, a calling in all of our lives to be more in our faith. 
I believe that God wants us to move out of what the world knows as the average Christian and step into what God desires for us as the normal Christian life. I think that we, we see this in the passage from Galatians 2, verse 20, when we read this. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That is God's call for us to live to his standard. And we don't do a great job of it very much. There is this struggle in our lives that is just holding many of us back from moving from average to normal. In week number one, we learned what this struggle of ours is. It's a, it's a universal struggle for all of mankind that has been around for all of our history. The struggle is the sin in all of our lives and then the sinners that we all are. There are the sins that we commit and then there are, is, the, is the sin nature that is inside of us. I do certain things that are against God, things that break his perfect law, things like lying or cheating or stealing or looking at things that I shouldn't look at or, or being addicted to things that I shouldn't be addicted to. We all do these things against God. That separates us from God because of who we are. We sin because we are sinners. So there, there are two areas that need to be handled in our lives. There are the, the, the sins that we need to be forgiven for, and then there is the sin nature that we need to be delivered from. Sin and the sinner. I, I want to move from the world's average idea of a Christian to God's normal, but I can't because of the sin in my life and the sinner that I am. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, if, 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 if I sin, that separates me from God and, and I need to be forgiven for that sin so that my relationship with God can be restored. So how do I do that? Well, it's, it, it's a two-part issue, so let's just start with the first part. First of all, in, in all the needs of humanity, we need to understand that God always has the answer. His answer is always His perfect, holy, and only Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer to every need, every worry, every doubt, every fear that we could ever have. With, with the answer to our problem being Jesus, in our second week together, we learned that the blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus, handles the problems of our sins. We learned that the penalty for our sins is paid by, by Jesus spilling his perfect and holy blood for us. We, we also learned that that, that that blood works in three ways. It works towards God, for man, and against Satan. The blood of Jesus handles the problem of our sins through the value that God sees in it by giving man a right relationship with the Father in heaven again and by taking away any accusation that the devil can bring against us. So with, with that, the blood of Jesus is the first answer to the, part of our, to the first part of our problem. So in week three, together, we learned that our sins are dealt with through the blood of Jesus, but the problem of us being sinners is still there. We sin because we are sinners. We can be forgiven over and over and over again for the sins in our lives because our good Father never runs out of grace. Like, that's awesome. It doesn't matter how many times you break stuff in the house, Dad's always going to forgive you. That's beautiful. But if that is the life that we settle for in our Christian faith, then we will never be more than just average. We will sin, repent, sin again. Sin, repent, sin again. And it'll just be this big cycle that we stay stuck in for the rest of our lives. We need to find the problem and we need to kill it. That is what the cross is for. The blood of Jesus is for our forgiveness and the cross of Jesus is for our victory. God put us in his son, Jesus, according to 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30, so that we could be included in his death, in his burial, and his resurrection. The, the cross of Jesus includes us. Because of the fact that we are included there, we are also included in, in Christ when he is, is labeled the last Adam and the second man. So in that we are now carried from where one person disobeyed God and many became sinners to where one other person obeyed God and many were made righteous. So the cross is the mighty act of God that carries us from Adam and the fall of man to Jesus and the resurrection of life, from average Christian lives to God's idea of normal, sin and the sinner. Now here we are together in week four, the final 
week of this series. So, where does an understanding of the previous three weeks bring us in how we should be living out our faith today? What are the last three weeks when we look through them and we just kind of pile them up and we look at them all together, where does that put us for how we should be living out our faith today? What, what, does it, what does it look like to see someone that has moved from average to God's normal? I, I explained to you on the very first message of this series that, that this was a study that, that would mainly come from working our way through the book of Romans. I also told you that I believe all the books of the Bible are, are tied together and work towards one goal. Well, that one goal is the gospel. And I think that as we study Romans together, we could all agree that Romans points us to the gospel. And so that's where we are today, not necessarily in Romans, but we're all over the gospel. So, so today, I want to look at the place of normal in the gospel. Normal belongs in the gospel. You've heard me talk these last four weeks now. Con- uh, average versus normal. Average versus normal. Where, what is this whole normal? It has a place in the gospel. So where is that for us? So to do that, we're going to look at the story um, I read it one time. In Mark, that's where it's at. In Mark chapter 14, in verses 3 through 9 is where we're going to be today. Let's read that together. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard. Sounds pretty, right? She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume? They asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you and and you can help them whenever you want to. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. The blood of Jesus addresses the sins in our lives and the, and the cross of Jesus addresses the sinners that we are. When we see and understand that, when we start living under that forgiveness and in that victory, then we will be a people that that move from what the world knows as average Christians to God's desire for us as normal Christians that walk and talk and breathe the idea that it is no longer I who live, but Christ living in me. And we will find ourselves over and over again in incidents like the one that we just read about. Handling sin in the center and moving from average to normal is the gospel. Why? Why why does that go together in any way at all? Why is, how can we say that? Well, because Jesus said that. Jesus said that the story of Mary anointing him with a jar of perfume over his head and its fragrance that filled the room should always be beside the gospel. The Lord anointed that moment. What Mary did should always be seen with what Jesus did. That's, That's his words. Jesus said that. Well, why that story, Jesus? Of all the things that happened throughout your ministry, why should we think about Mary and her jar of nard when we see the gospel? I'm pretty sure that most of us know this story of Mary stopping the party, and uh, most of us have heard it pretty well, the, 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 the time that Mary went too far at the party. It happens. People get out of control, you know. The music's there, and then somebody gets their hand on the volume button. Next thing you know, somebody's trying to do a trust fall off the coffee table, and your Uncle Bill is peeing in the plant in the corner. We're like, that's a fake plant, Bill. What you doing? Somebody always goes too far at the party. And if you don't know who that person is, it's probably you. I just want to throw that out there and let you know. Anyways, to the party with Mary. We, we've heard this story. We know it. So um, when, when we look at it in John chapter 12, we see that this moment, this party just happened right after her brother is brought back to life. All right. We also learn there that, that her family wasn't exactly rich. They weren't exactly the wealthy crew on the street. In fact, the sisters 
had to work at this dinner that was happening in the house. We read in John 12 and 2, it tells us that the dinner was prepared in Jesus's honor and that Martha served. Hmm, look at that. Luke 10, 40 says that Martha was upset that, that night because of how much work she had to do to prepare this meal. So we know that this family was not a rich family and that every dollar mattered to them. Every penny was precious to them. And then we see this Mary, one of, one of those sisters, she, she took what was probably one of, one of the most expensive things in the house, something that was like set to the side in a special spot, a special shelf. It's like, here's, here's Aunt Bertha's ashes and here's this jar of perfume, like a special place that nobody touched. And it, you just kind of told stories about it up on the wall, this, this thing of great value and honor in her family. Uh, they, they said it, it could have been sold for an entire year's wages. So basically $30,000 worth of perfume. And she broke it and used the entire thing on the Lord. That's messed up. Like that's, that's absolutely crazy. You've lost your mind. Hey, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Okay, but in the human brain, like the, the, the human mind, that makes absolutely zero sense. It's just too much. Who in the world would pour $30,000 worth of perfume over somebody? Well, what, what, what does it say again in Mark 14 and verse 4? Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. We understand like what it means to take care of a guest in your house. You get them something to drink or you want something to, something to eat or, hey, let's go have a campfire. You, let me get you a good cigar. You can sit down and relax. But there's no need to waste $30,000 worth of perfume on somebody. Like that's just dumb. That, that's just too much. You're, you're going too far, Mary. You, you just gave Jesus more than he is worth. Mark 14, verse 4 and 5. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. These verses bring us to what I believe that sin and the sinner, um, um, average and normal death to life, blood and the cross have all been pointing us to in the gospel. And it's, and it's this little word that we see right in the middle there, waste. Why waste such expensive perfume? Why waste, waste? What is waste? What, 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 is that, what does that mean? The, the dictionary defines waste like this, to consume, spend, or employ uselessly or without adequate return. Do you understand that? It means that you gave too much for something. You, you can buy a donut for 50 cents, so why would you spend a dollar, you know? If I could run one time in my life and be skinny, why would I ever run again, you know? Why would you go to school for four years if all you need to do is go to school for two years to get the degree that you want and the job that you want? Like, you're, you're just going too far, all right? Don't be a try hard. You're, you're paying too much, Karen. You're, you're giving more than what is needed. Waste means that you gave too much for too little. Now, now, wait, wait a minute, bub. We are dealing with something here that, that Jesus said should go out with the gospel, like wherever it is preached throughout the world. Why would we ever equate the goodness of the gospel with wastefulness? Why, why would we ever talk about the gospels, like God giving the life of his only perfect, holy, righteous son for the life of many disobedient sinners, and at the same time, talk about a woman that poured $30,000 worth of perfume on Jesus' head in the middle of dinner. Because Jesus wants us to make sure that when we share the gospel, we share the lesson of what Mary did on that day. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. We, we, we need to know and understand and we need to teach that people should come to Jesus and waste themselves on him. 
That is, that is what God is looking for in his normal Christian. There are two ideas of wasted that I think we need to look at here. And I'm not talking about your college days, all right? And biblically looking at it. Um, John Piper, a famous author, wrote a book um, called Don't Waste Your Life. And the idea of wasting your life that he is speaking towards is, is the world's idea of, of wasting something. In our passage today, though, we have Judas's idea of wasted, and we have Mary's idea of wasted. And so let's, let's start with Judas, all right? Judas is the guy that, first of all, never called Jesus Lord. Look that up for your fun Bible fact. Mary could have poured anything in the room on Jesus, and Judas would have thought that it was a waste. She, she could have grabbed like a bucket of water and like psh, thrown it on Jesus' face and be like, I want to anoint you. And Judas would have like argued like, hey, we, that could have, could have gone to satisfy the thirst of somebody traveling through our city tonight. You know, he would have been mad about it. Mary could have went and, and grabbed the, the, the bottom of the, the bowl of chips, all the broken chips that nobody eats because you can't get any salsa on it. And all you end up doing is just digging your fingers through the guac and you're like, hey, that's gross. And she could have taken that, put it on Jesus' head as a, a way of anointing him. And, and Judas would have argued, hey, man, we could have used that in soup to feed the hungry down the street. No matter what Mary used to anoint Jesus with that night, Judas would have seen it as a waste and been mad about it. And here you and I are, reading this story together. You know, here we are today, turning your Bibles with me, reading this story. And when we see this part about how Judas responded, we think things like, what a dork, Judas, man. I I would have told him to shut up and sit down. Hey, at least it's at least it's not at least I'm 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 taking this stuff and I'm wasting it on this hero and not a zero like you, Judas. You know, so right? Are you with me? Do you, do you get mad when you read the Bible? Because it's real. It really happened. And so I, I see things and I read things and I get upset about it. And so Judas stands up and yells at a woman at dinner. Who does that? Like that's you don't. Somebody slap him. You weren't raised in the South. You just don't speak to people like that. But what we need to understand is that when Judas was speaking, when he stood up and he said those things, he was just speaking for the world in this moment. He, he was just saying what the world was thinking. Didn't see that coming, did you? That's, that's all he was doing in the world's understanding of Christians following Jesus, us giving our lives to serve him and love him and help others do the same. It's a complete waste. The, the world doesn't love Jesus. The the world doesn't accept Jesus. The world doesn't have a place for Jesus. Look at every public argument that is happening in the world today. I was just talking with a friend of mine tonight about this. Look at every argument that is happening in the world today. Everybody gets to share their opinion except the Christian. Why is that? Because Jesus is not of this world. And if Christians are in Jesus, then we don't belong either. The world knows it. You know it. I know it. And Jesus knows it. Look, he even talks about it. He says it in the Bible in John chapter 17 and verse 16. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. So if the world thinks about Jesus in this manner, in this way, then the world also thinks that giving anything to him is a waste. That means that when you come to church, that's a waste. When you tithe, that's a waste. When you pray, that's a waste. When you have community and you build each other up, you serve in your community, you help people down the street, that's a waste. Giving anything to Jesus is a waste. So Judas definitely thought that what Mary did was a waste. You can read John 12 later on, and you can see how Judas felt about it, really. I mean, you get into that, and he's like, man, we could have we used that for something else. Have you walked in our streets lately? There's poor people just lining up on the streets out there. We could have sold that perfume and bought some food. We could have cured world hunger. We, we could have given it to the city to build a new park with. There are so many practical and logical things that we could have done with that. Why would you waste it and pour it out at the feet of Jesus? That is exactly how the world thinks too. Someone told my wife one time that they could not believe that she was wasting her college degree to stay at home and raise our children. She did. We had children. Michelle finished her contract and she stayed at home to be with our kids. What a waste of an education. We had somebody tell us that we were abusing our children by bringing them to mission trips in Mexico with us. 
multiple people thought that we were crazy for quitting our jobs and becoming pastors. Can't you do something better with your life? Who would want to do that? You, you should use your vacation to take your kids to the beach, not some mission trip where they just stay dirty the whole time. That, oh, that's just too far. You, you can serve in the church, but moving and starting your own church, that's just too much. A wasted life in the eyes of Judas. Then we need to hear from Mary. We need to see Mary's thoughts on this. And when I, when I think about that I, I kind of get like a like an interview kind of going on you know like the, the nightly news you know like here's alan with the nightly news hello world i'm here tonight with mary the woman that broke a jar open and poured it on jesus's head at dinner many people that night mary surrounding the table said that you are absolutely loco crazy in the head and that you don't know what's going on in your life they said that what you did was a waste do you agree with that and then i see mary in this, this kind of interview that's happening in the pandemonium of my brain, and she's going, absolutely, yes, I wasted. Wait, 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 Pastor. Are you, are you saying that you agree with Judas and that Mary wasted it? Yes, I am. I believe that Mary wasted what she had on Jesus in a way that only someone that is living God's normal Christian life could do. It is no longer I who live. It is Christ that lives inside of me conquering sin and the sinner and moving from average to normal means that we become people that waste their lives on Jesus. Would, would you do that? When, would, would you, you, you would spend all of that? Would, would, you would give all, all of that to, to Jesus and the church and, and to your faith? That's, that's just too much. That's, that, that's a waste. But if the Lord is worthy, then how can it be a waste? He is worthy to be served. He is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be talked about. He is worthy of my time. He is worthy of my family. He is worthy of whatever money I have in my pocket. He's worthy of my, my gifts. He is worthy for me to be his prisoner. He is worthy for me to live completely for him. He is worthy. What the world says does not matter. And if we worry about the world, then we just need to get comfortable being average. What the world says does not matter. The world says, yeah, you're wasting your life. Faith is not worth it. You can be doing better things. Look back to Mark 14, verses 6 through 7. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want, but you will not always have me. Christian, Christian, listen. Do not get tired and quit because of the attacks in your life. You're in good company. Jesus steps in and he tells the world to step back. You could definitely use your gifts and talents in a billion other ways. There's there's no doubt about that. There's no way to argue against that. You could could be feeding the poor right now, but, but pouring your life out at the feet of Jesus is a good work. And it's a good word because Jesus says so. Do you remember how we talked about our sins are paid for with the blood of Jesus because of the value that God puts on the blood, not us? God puts the value on the blood of Jesus. That's not our job. That's that's God's job. He puts the value. He determines the value. And so so, so when, 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 we, when we look at sin and the sinner and we move from average to normal and we can fully say that it is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me and we see the real worth of our Lord Jesus, nothing is too good and nothing is too much for him. Nothing at all. The, the gospel, the good news of Jesus and the life that it births in us calls us to more. It calls us to more. Jesus takes the actions of Mary at dinner in, in Bethany that night, and he holds it in the, in the shadow of his cross, and he says, this is your more. This is your more. This is what I mean by that. Forgiveness for sins in your life and victory of the sinner that you are will, will take you from being an average Christian in the standards of, of the world, and it'll move you to live God's idea of his normal Christian. And, and it'll move you to pour out all that you have, all that you are, your, your very self at his feet. You are to give absolutely all that you are to Jesus. Take everything that is you, all of your gifts and your talents and your character and your love and your hope and your dreams, and you pour it out at the feet of Jesus. And let me tell you this, if Jesus 
never has you go on a big mission trip or he never has you plant a thousand churches or he never has you start some big organization that solves, um, solves world hunger or something like that. But instead, he has you faithfully giving at his feet. Then you need to know that that is enough. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Satisfy the Lord with your life. Satisfy Jesus with your life. Jesus is not concerned with you walking into eternity with a big list of all the good works that you did in your life. Like the hungry will be fed, the the, the poor will get some clothes on their back. Did, did, Did you waste yourself on Jesus? That is what matters. We can get together and we can plan huge conferences with like the greatest pastors in the world, the greatest speaker there is. We can bring in the biggest bands and have them play the loudest music with the greatest light show and millions of people can come to it. We can write book after book after book about God's love and then we can send copies of it in all different languages all over the world. We, we can do all of this uh, uh, stuff for Jesus and get to heaven and be completely disappointed when we find out that those things weren't the goal. God isn't concerned about the works that we do for him. His first priority is with our position at his feet and our anointing of his head. Do we lay everything down and claim that he is all we need? That's the question of this. That's the question of the gospel. That's how we satisfy God. And we won't be able to do that until we move from average to God's normal. Are we ready to do that, church? Are we ready to be that kind of people? Are we ready to move from average to normal in our faith and turn our community upside down? You can't wait till tomorrow for it. You you can't. You can't put it off like, you know what? I'm going to finish a few things and then I'll fully commit. No, you need to sign up now. You can't wait until tomorrow. That's that's why Jesus said this in verse 8. She has done what she could do and has anointed my body for burial ahead of of time after Jesus was 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 murdered and put in the tomb a group of women went to anoint his body and they, and they couldn't do it but they, they went they carried their little jars and all their cloths and all this and they went to anoint the body of Christ but they couldn't do it because they found that the tomb was empty and that Jesus had risen from the dead so only one person in all of history got to anoint Jesus. It was Mary. When when she broke what was most precious to her, all of her worth and value and poured it out over Jesus. Don't wait for tomorrow and miss what Jesus has for you today. Let's let's look one more time at how this passage finishes in Mark 14 and verse 9. I tell you the truth. Wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. One of the first questions that I asked you today was why would Jesus say something like this? Why would he say that this story of Mary should be told beside the gospel? It's because Mary's story is a story of the gospel fully realized in someone's life. Her story is the story of someone that has moved from average to normal. Someone that's, that, 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 that willing, willingly comes and gives all that they have, all that they are, and holds nothing back. They just take everything and they strip down their pride and their arrogance. They strip down their, even their faults. They strip down their accomplishments. They strip down the things that they have, have earned. Like, here's all my trophies. I don't need those. And they just come and they stand naked before the Lord, giving everything to Him, holding nothing back, waste their lives at the feet of Jesus. They die to their old self so that they can live their new life in the resurrection of Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That person satisfies the Lord. The gospel is not just for sinners. Sinners are set free and redeemed and made right before God and satisfied in the gospel. But the first work of the gospel is about God. It is about satisfying 
God. We should never make anything about us. Well, the gospel is here to save me. Yes, and in saving you and you coming to this realization of what God has for you, the more that he has for you in your life, you are satisfying God. So you and, and, and your role in the gospel is satisfying God. It's not about us. It should never be about us. It's not about man, his glory, his honor forever and ever. Angels are circling the throne of God and they are singing for all all of eternity, all you people that don't like songs that are, are seven words sung 24 times over and over again, get used to it because it's going to be in heaven. The angels are there and they're singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Can you imagine the angels doing that? The first one goes and he's like, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then the second angel comes up and he's like, oh yeah, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then the third angel comes along and he's like, oh, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There's no mention of me in there. There's no mention of you in there. There's no mention of your sin in there. There's no mention of your accomplishment. It's all about God. It's never about us, and it's all about Him. The person that sees and receives the gospel, the person that understands that they need to die to themselves and and live to Christ, that person that wastes their life on Jesus satisfies God. And that is the greatest more that we could ever have. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to step into the more that God has for you. You might have been sitting there listening to me just going at it this whole time. Maybe just today, maybe for the last four weeks, and you're like, you know what? I don't know what you're talking about. Maybe something has just clicked in your brain about, this is what I'm missing. Is this what you're missing? Are you ready for the more? If that is you, if you need to start your relationship with God today, would you pray with me? Would you just pray this prayer with me? There's no magic in in the words of this prayer. It's simply you declaring that to Jesus that, that he is Lord. So if you're, if you're watching and you're seeing this revelation of, God, I, I need this in my life, that, that is what I'm missing. If you need to do that, then, 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 then just pray with this. God, I have made decisions that have separated me from you. I'm sorry, Lord. Will you forgive me? I understand that I need the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins. I understand that I need the cross of Jesus for victory over who I am. Jesus, you are Lord. Be Lord in my life. I've wasted it long enough, and now I want to waste it on you. Thank you, Lord. If you prayed that today, can I be the first person to congratulate you? You just made the biggest decision of your life. I started this series um, by, by, by the first, the first week we, we preached this message and we ended it with an opportunity to invite people into a relationship with the Lord. And then we, we took the next two weeks and we taught through the struggles that we have. And now I thought it would be fitting for us to come to week four and give that same opportunity. And so if you've stayed with us or if this is your first time with us today and, and you prayed that prayer, I just want to say congratulations. And I want to say welcome to the family of God. We are with you. We are beside you. We are praying for you as you try to figure out this new life of freedom in Christ, this new life of of victory in the cross, this this new life that, that sounds completely weird, but you are now can waste on Jesus. We're with you in it. We're with you in it. Would you all pray with me now uh, together as we end our time to get today? Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for today. Thank you for this series. Thank you for the, the push that it's been in my personal life to understand more of who I am in you and, and more of, of what you have for me. God, I pray that as we've walked through Scripture after Scripture after Scripture, that we've done so in a way that is faithful and true, in a way that brings honor and glory to your name. God, be with us as we learn more about how how your your blood works for us, your your cross works. Uh, God, how we move from being just average to being your normal. And God, how, how we can have lives that are like Mary, that when the gospel is talked about, that that act is talked about as well. A life that is just wasted, 
poured out at the feet of Jesus. God, may we do that. Push us. Make us a people that just want to chase after you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Church, thank you for being with us today. Uh, We love you. We miss you. We hope to see you soon back together where we can hug physically and all that stuff. We love you. Have a great week. Thank you all again so much for tuning in with us. I really hope this really touched your hearts. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to us or anyone here at the church, and we'd love to answer your questions. And we'll see you all next week.